basically what we are going to talk next uh, 90 minutes it's uh, not only talk actually uh, we are going to tell you about uh, educational games um, which we do and which you can do and which uh, what is the reason why it's cool also we will uh, play one game so we'll try it out and also we will share with you the knowledge and outcomes we learn uh, while making these games what you need to keep in mind to actually run successful any educational game uh, from like general perspective but with the practical details uh, we are not going to talk about acad academic uh, stuff mostly from the field on uh, youth and adult education so yeah yeah i just wanted to add that uh, um, uh, as marco said uh, we we know some theories about games and we learned some interesting uh, academic things about games but here we will mostly present what we learned from practice because uh, yeah because next slide i think will explain it. yeah so uh, my name is marco as you can uh, read it and see and uh, i'm involved in uh, education uh, since 2008 so 12 years and uh, all the time, uh, because I really like uh, games and also like fun, um, we was using in different purposes. So, yeah, basically this is uh, my background. I'm originally from uh, Crimea and now I live in Poland, in Poznan, and running here a Logos in Joe in Poland, together with Emir. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, hello, my name is Emir. And uh, since that picture was taken, I've lost some hair, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Marco gained some. And um, what I do, I also work in uh, NGO sector since 2005, which is a long 15 years journey. And also my like my profession is uh, trainings. I do trainings, business trainings, and I worked as a professional business trainer for five years. And it's scary to say that I worked in the bank. And um, yeah, so I have some experience of not doing of doing uh, educational games not only in the NGO area but also in some um, other areas, like say for bank workers. So uh, some of conclusions that we will speak about and some of the games we will speak about and some of the information comes from both sides of uh, my job. Yeah. And as same as Marco, I also work in non-governmental international organization Logos, which we started in 2013. It started in Ukraine. And Marco? Yeah, now it's operate in uh, Poland and Latvia as well. And we have small initiative group in Netherlands and Groningen. Uh, just a quick update of what we actually doing, what is enjoy about, so you have uh, to understand our background. Uh, we have uh, five main areas of work we do. Uh, one of them really important is human rights education. Uh, we will talk about it later. But as uh, the main point uh, which we would like to focus that um, I also studied law and uh, did my master in uh, human rights. And what we find out is that to actually educate people about human rights, it's not easy. And also sometimes can be a bit boring. So uh, that's why uh, we, what we learn and what we start to focus it is that we actually educate people not about articles or some case started, uh, studies from European Court of Human Rights because they don't need to anyone else except uh, advocacy and um, researchers, but more about awarenesses. So how to build an awareness in certain human rights issues to actually to prevent uh, violation and um, uh not uh, fair uh, treatment or uh, discriminated behavior so this is basically what we do uh, and we'll teach you and show you how we do it in other working areas it's uh, migrants and minorities uh it's uh, we're not going to focus on it much but uh, the idea is that we also have a local project international on this topic it's also connect to human rights topic uh, a part of it we do outdoor education uh, because uh this actually is like live game when you with a group on uh, mountains for seven days 35 people then you don't need to made up anything new you just there because you need to basically manage your life like basic practicalities and it's fantastic experience uh another part uh, emir you can help me with critical thinking yeah uh yesterday we had this session about skepsis uh, movement that we are supporting and running 
so we are paying some attention to critical thinking and media literacy and as i already seen on this game changer camp a lot of organizations are doing this and which means i think that this is a very uh very urgent uh, topic and issue and also we do some uh, some activities connected to soft skills but you can learn more at uh, logos and joe we will not stop here too much marco and what is important is that we have uh, our target audience are mostly young people from Poland, Ukraine and um, other European countries. So um, when we started working with uh, in Logos, we came uh, to this problem that uh, it's not maybe a problem, it's just a fact that sometimes it's difficult to keep attention of young people, whatever you do, whether you do a one hour workshop, or seven day long uh, youth exchange or training course young people tend to be interested in a lot of things but they tend to have short attention span and you know now we live in era of instagram and TikTok. and if you know the instagram videos they have the length of 60 seconds and TikTok is even shorter there are like 15 seconds videos so uh and this is our target audience these are the people that we have to work with and that we want to work with. So when we started uh, doing uh, activities with them, we came to this problem that we need somehow to keep them involved. We need to keep their attention. And through our experience, through our um, work, we found out that the best and maybe the only way is to, to involve them is to play games. Yeah. My games, uh, because uh, here we can go actually maybe a bit more to the psychology and the nature of the games that it's absolutely nature of us to play the games like uh we uh we are both dads now with the mir and uh, we we see it like every day uh, that uh, the game it's actually what we start from the early early beginning and um yeah it's also have some rules and every time have educational point uh, and i made this uh picture of a uh, go playing a hide and seek game but also to make this uh, slide cool we add the cats because it's every time works whatever you do uh and do not uh, to to have some now raise international and intergalactic uh, conflicts between people we also add dogs uh, so we will not split our audience yeah so uh if, if, if all people who are like every person or uh, let's say maybe every mammal as well since they are born they are uh, they're playing they're playing games uh, mostly to learn something new quite often to practice some skills or knowledge and yes marco you see people are reacting to yes, a dog yes. and a cat yes that was a really good decision to put both of them <laughs> thank you kasha and yeah so uh yeah so games are really natural and uh there, there are some other things that are important about games. We go with the next point. Uh, the games are fun. It's a fact. And uh, there is actually, we have a question uh, to people. Uh, you can write in chat or maybe you can actually join and maybe to share why you think the game actually it's a fun and why it's, why it's cool. Just uh, from your own perspective, from whatever you know, whatever you try just sentences or join us this video and in uh, a voice yeah and while people are thinking what to comment uh, in the comment section uh, we can discuss maybe why marco you think games are fun yeah i like because it's relaxed i um, i'm a hard worker but i also had relaxer so i like it yeah and uh yeah i just want to remind that we are waiting for your maybe comments on why do you think games are fun if you think game games are fun maybe actually you think that games are not fun and this would be interesting to listen as well because people are different and um yeah what i think uh, why i think games are fun because they have they create this feeling of the flow if you know the concept of the flow is uh is developed by this um scientist and philosopher michael chiksen mihai who uh, made this idea that uh, flow is the state of uh, your mind and your body when you're so much involved into something that you forget about how time passes around so you are ma you have maximum concentration and you're maximally involved and i think the games are the things that create this feeling uh like 
like in almost instantly yeah so if especially if this game is interesting so if you check the uh, the pictures even that we put here on our slide these are all super different ki kinds of uh, yeah we're not when you're not multitasking it's a flow thank you Naomi. that's a good point and kasha is also commenting uh, that games are relaxing that's a good uh, point as well though it's not always relaxing for example if you ever played monopoly with your friends Sometimes uh, it breaks some friendships, you know. <laughs> I think, Marco, when we play board games, sometimes we don't speak then for a couple of hours. Yeah. And um, But anyway, uh, games are super involving. And uh, thanks to the way the games are made and the games are designed, they're, uh, they're made to, uh, to involve people. And sometimes you can play games on your own. Like, for example, the guy is playing on the phone. But quite often, games involve other people like most of the other games too so me and my husband can <laughs> yeah ah, you mean monopoly or something else Kasia? <laughs> it, it's a raising conflict probably yeah it's fa family yeah. board games is not really the best idea so yeah and um yeah if you have some more ideas why games are uh, fun you can also comment but uh we will we, we have some ideas why games are good for education So uh, there is this concept uh, that uh, I think that George, uh, in the previous session, I, I I feel really bad that I couldn't attend it because I think it was super informative and interesting, spoke about edutainment, which is the combination of education and entertainment. Marco, yes. And um, so why is, this is like, I think is, a, I, maybe George, you said everything about edutainment, but anyway, I will just repeat shortly. So. Uh, I think edutainment is the trend which is being, uh, which is dominating the education currently, like in almost every area. Uh, people, because we have a lot of things that distract us from everyday life. You know, one of the biggest problems, like when which people have when they do some education, is that our smartphones. So I think all of you have seen this picture, or maybe all of you. You see, uh, you sit in front of the people. You start. You speak to them. You start. You deliver some very interesting information, and they look in their phones. You know, they spend their time there, and uh, because of this challenge, because and many other challenges, because people are distracted. There is this uh, edutainment approach, which uh, rose, and for many other reasons as well, which combines education with entertainment, because this is how people want to get their knowledge. So how it happens? People are gamifying everything like starting and actually this is not only about education so recently i've heard this like so as me and marco we both have small children now at some age there there is the problem of uh, that you have to make children brush their teeth yeah so and children usually don't like that like why would they do it because this doesn't make any sense for them so uh, i learned recently that there's this like special toothbrush uh, with like some uh, I don't know Wi-Fi connection, and you can connect to it, to an app at the um, uh, iPad, and launch an app there. Which uh, and if you if you move the toothbrush, the app also shows how you fight some monsters. So and this is the way for to make children learn and to gain this habit of uh, washing brushing their teeth. No, so um, entertainment is everywhere. People want to be entertained. And we as uh, youth workers, we as NGO workers, we cannot uh, stay away from this activity. And uh, because we often work with young people, we have to use games everywhere. And now because we like games, and I think a lot of people who came here also like games, we want to play. And uh, yes, before, like what we will play now, Marco, you can turn off your camera if you want, and I will explain what we will do. Yeah. So we will play a little uh, online quest. And before we play, I will just explain you. Yes, right, Laura. Yeah. So uh, just simple puzzle logic that you will apply here. And uh, this logic is uh, looks like this. So first, you search for some kind of information or for some kind of solution. You think what you can do with this information, you try different ways and then you apply. And this is what we'll do. We made really short quest, like we expect it not to be longer than 15 minutes, uh, maybe up to 20. And um, yeah, and uh, hopefully how it will happen, we will have uh, breakout rooms. And as I see, there are 18 of us and I think like four of, or five of us are 
organizers. Though I think uh, Noemi also, if you want, can play. And Magda, if you're not too busy, you can also play. Uh, so what we will do, we will have uh, four rooms. So Francesco, can we create four rooms? Yeah, if you hear me, just you can do it. And uh, what we will do now, we will give some explanation. They're ready. They're ready. Huh? They're ready. Wow, you're amazing. So if you go to, I see. But don't go now. Don't go, yeah, now. don't go now. Wait, wait a second. We will explain some more things to you. Uh, so, yeah, Francesco is amazing. We all know that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, after we explain what to do, you will go to the rooms, and this will. The rooms are called uh, Room One: Educational Games from Practitioners. Room Two, Room Three, and uh, Francesco. Maybe we need Room Four as well. I it's, just created it. It's, okay. It should be there now. Amazing. So, what is the quest actually? Thank you, Naomi, about asking that. And uh, the quest will be explained by. And to explain the quest, I invite the Almighty, horrifying God of Boredom. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am the horrifying God of Boredom. And today I wake up and I have to plan to destroy it and read all from all the games on this planet. So why that's why I would like to have this boredom everywhere. So humanities will not have games anymore. But to protect the games of destroyment, you need to prove me why the games should exist and humanity need to take advantage of it. <sighs> For it, I'm going to send you in this chat a small task. <laughs> you have 20 minutes to solve it all. Oh no! You all solved the puzzles! <laughs> and now we need to keep these games in this planet! <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, so the team Spitook one was the first one to send me to send the email to the uh, evil god of boredom, and I will just ask uh, people to who played the game to jump in now. And Francesco, can you please let everybody in who wants to join? Maybe like uh, the the room that I was looking, uh, Claudia, Julia, and uh, Laura. I think uh, if you don't mind, just for a couple of seconds for a couple of comments, can you please come in? Hello. Hi, Claudia. Hi. Hi, hi. So uh, while everyone is joining, Claudia, just a couple of, uh, just a question. So how was the game for you? Hi, Laura. It hi. was really fun, but I think if, if I would have been alone, I would have never guessed it. Also, like, alone, I would have said, okay, I pass. But with Laura and Julia, I was like, no, let's try this, let's try that. It was really fun. Yes, it was fun from my side too, and it was also challenging because because it, 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 uh, you need to, to think about the topic and also I don't know the others, but I feel the, the time pressure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so, by okay. the way, the question to you, Laura, how much time do you think have passed since you started? Uh, uh, without checking I, can, I can watch the clock because I saw when we started. Yes, but I think it was less than um, because mm -hmm. now it's half past uh, one and we. <laughs> I didn't get. Uh, it was ten minutes for in my mind, mm, fifteen minutes, but not more. But how how long did we need? For me, it was like ten minutes maximum. It was it was forty. Forty, yes. <laughs> For three, <laughs> we started ten minutes to, to one. Uh, Julia, so uh, what was the fun part for you when you played the game? Like the the most funny part was that we crack the task about football, and I'm zero in football, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was cool to 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 hear you like I told you like you were kind of angel who just don't let us just felt. <laughs> So, um, what do you think? Um, what did you learn from this game? Did you learn anything new for Never you? Never give up. 
So football players' names? No. Uh -huh. To read okay, the rules. Football of players' names. Okay, excuse me. To read the rules and to read the task before <laughs> starting. <laughs> That's a very, a very good important point. <laughs> yes, and to read it again. Yeah. <laughs> and that uh, working together is better than alone. That's amazing. That's amazing. And uh, actually, I would say that uh, the team work in this kind of games always makes it faster. Thank you, girls. Uh, thank you. I was uh, watching you and it was a uh, big enjoyment for me and big pleasure. Thank you for your game. And uh, Sput no, not Sputnik. Uh, what was it? Sput Sput Sputnik one. Sputnik one. <laughs> <laughs> Spituk, Spituk one. Yeah, you are amazing. Spituk one. Thank you. Thank you. So, and uh, I also have Marco. Uh, maybe you have some comments from the team that played with you in one room? Uh, yes. Uh, it should be nice if uh, Kasia uh, and Ekaterina will join us also here now. Uh, if, you, if you're here, girls. Uh, because they. Hi. Hey. Hi, Ekaterina. Hi, Amir. Hi. Nice to meet you all. It was really fun for the first 20 minutes. I didn't figure out how, because our audio didn't work. And then after it worked, we started to play the game. And uh, with, with the help of, help of Marco, we cracked the first thing and then it was easier. But it was really nice and I didn't think it could take so much time and that it can pass that fast. And what was the most difficult part for you, like in the whole game, like in the, the first, game? Or? The first, uh, the first uh, task, not the first, the, the email. That one was really easy. The first, the the one with the dice, because I I didn't uh, I did, didn't put together the uh, sentence and the dice. I I was thinking first about the letters of the alphabet, maybe or something, and I. Uh, after that, uh, it was uh, clearer when the, when Castia uh, figured out and uh, with Marta's help. Great. It great. was really nice. I liked it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your game. Um, uh, so for those, uh, so girls, you can now leave or you can stay if you want. It's up to you. <laughs> uh, so for those who just joined us right now, uh, just a small update what we are doing. We just played an, uh, a game. Uh, a short quest game and the idea for us was to show you how how the games work like do you remember before we said that uh games make you put you into this condition of the flow when you don't understand how much time has passed and uh laura and uh you and girls they said that it was like 10 minutes and this is how it happens in real life and uh, for example for us in this game we had several educational points that we wanted to include First one was to show how the games work and how you can uh, even using like online, which is not the best way actually to play, though it's super possible, uh, how it works. And we also wanted to give you small uh, information about sports and games. And uh, so when I asked, like, I think now you know about Dices a little bit because I think some of you opened articles on Wikipedia. Now you know about uh, Ulama game because all of you wrote emails to me. Actually, I have I had three emails coming, uh, and uh, I don't know the third. Uh, Katarzyna, I think she also wrote an email, but uh, I never heard from her. Uh, so uh, and this was our educational goal and to show how it can work. So uh, after this, we can and we will come back to this example to show you some of the how we developed this game. We developed this game specially for this uh, for this session. And now we want to speak a little bit about our experience, how we use game in our everyday work, in our use work and other work. Marco? Yeah, so uh, basically uh, here we listed it, it, the games we use basically every week uh, when we had our learning mobilities. And um, yeah, they uh, obviously you know about team building games, yeah, which is the main idea. It's basically to uh, to unite the group, and why it's important, and why we find it's really uh, necessary for uh, our uh, learning mobilities when we gather people for let's say seven days, thirty people with different background. That with the, this game, they will really pass fast all possible dynamic in the group. So the groups become formed, and it's become more efficient later to work with this group when in a say half of day was donated to it and then it's easy to work with the people as well if it's basic team building game you can also um you can um, 
uh, talk about communications uh, when people are trying to solve some issues or some puzzles or let's say to move some object from one place to another but without using hands let's say then we also later reflect and work with them how they actually communicate and it's also can be done in the topic of uh, non-violent communication leadership uh, like uh, ability to listen and to see the different point of views etc so super useful we are not going to go deeper but it can be done in different levels of uh, the game. Yeah. Another, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the second point that we wanted to put are so-called background games, how we call them. And I have a question, who of you knows what is Gossip Box or have ever encountered this at some kind of training courses or um, seminars or anywhere? If you have encountered them, can you please put plus in the uh, chat? Uh, okay, Laura knows. Yeah, also secret friend killer game yeah uh, yeah i think secret uh, secret friend is more uh, obvious you cannot hear me marco can you hear me yes yes mm, that's strange why hirieta can hear me hirieta what about now gossips gossips yes we can yeah so uh we will just uh, tell you what is the gossip box. Uh, it's this kind of uh, like at uh, training courses we and use exchanges. We do this box like a regular box, and it's signed gossip box where people have a chance to write some little notes with some fun stuff about them or other people. And this is and uh, this sounds like a stupid game, but this is actually an easy way to get people closer to each other. Like almost on the first day, like let's say on the second day of the uh of the training course or use exchange and uh, how it works like for example you can write any kind of gossip and usually these gossips are mostly fun so for example i can write a gossip hey i saw marco today in the night eating from the common fridge yeah and this doesn't have to be true because it's gossip and we moderate the gossips in order for them not to be uh, not to be harmful for anyone or to have some maybe bad words uh, and actually, in order to make uh, people start to write gossips, because they usually don't know how to do it and they don't have much experience about this, we, me and Marco, we usually write first like 10, 20 gossips ourselves and then we read them. But later people come and join and they like it and they start doing this. So every day we read gossips in the morning. And this game, it's, it's very short. It takes like 15 minutes in the morning, but it energizes people and it makes people closer because they get to learn more about each other and they have this fun part that is uh, that is involved into this activity. And about secret game and secret friend game and killer game, I think you maybe heard of them. The idea is, uh, I will say about secret friend is that you have one secret friend who gives you little presents and little things while you uh, while you're staying, for example, for a week. And uh, this is a good way also to connect different people to build some uh, some kind of interesting relationships between them so that they can communicate and cooperate and do some ni nice things. And also quite often uh, it's uh, the presents that they give to each other are visible. So uh, we do it uh, quite often. And usually in the end of the project, in the end of the training course, we have like people who have a lot of chocolates and um, a lot of nice stuff and presents. Marco? Uh, yeah, you yeah. will talk about uh, icebreakers. Uh, I mean, we are not going to go deeper, but you all know that uh, it's uh, it's actually quite energetic to make some small baby shark game with the people. But also what we learn, OK, you do it with the young people. It's make fun. It's get a uh, positive energy. But also when you do uh, Emir practice, it's a lot in the bank. Uh, when he do it for directors of and the head offices of a bank in the Norwegian oh, branches, yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, like uh, the ladies, the guys dancing uh, some stuff, it's actually even more fun. And uh, so don't sh shy to actually try and uh, just explain the rules correctly. Yeah, uh, so uh, just one little comment, Marco. So uh, I think this is an important comment from Marco. Why? Because some people think that games are for kids only. And this is not like that. This is not true. Uh, adult love games and adult people actually get involved in the games, uh, like, let's say, same way as children. And sometimes they can make even more meaning and more sense out of the game than uh, younger people, than children. 
and so on. Uh, Yulia, I saw your question about killer game. Uh, we don't really have much time. We want to speak about some other things. Maybe maybe later. If, you, if you want, we can, uh, after this session, let people go to the lunch. And those of you who want to stay, we can discuss and we can give you a lot of different ideas. OK. So Marco. Yeah, and the mitigation of boring stuff. Uh, this is also what we learn uh, together with our partners. So uh, sometimes when you have a learning mobilities, you gather people for such a period to learn something on use exchange, you still have common responsibilities. Or let's say you're in outdoor and you need to put a tent, make a fire, bring the water. How to make it in a game way that people actually will do it? Uh, you can also gamify it. And for it, we made a board this is a board from Czech Republic uh, from training course uh, on escape rooms. So basically, we divide people on the four groups. Uh, this the same uh, they was uh, they made the name, and the, all of them have a rules and have a specific shift to pick up a task. And if they late on a session, they get minus point. If they do something, they get bonuses. And in the end, we give some basic presents, uh, which is. And it's keep people motivated and also form common responsibility when the eight people was responsible for the task and encouraging other people to do it. And it was really cool. People were shouting in the morning that their team was uh, like ready to, to rock today. And uh, it's a fantastic tool. So um, you can also do it in this way. Yeah. And also additionally to that, uh, we had uh, the, the tasks like cleaning the room or writing the report about the day, which are usually no one wants to do it. But when you gamify them, when you give points to people and in the end you give a chocolate to a team, it turns out that people, when they're in the game, they can do any kind of stuff. You just have to, create, you have to create this um, surrounding, this uh, method which will involve them in this. And we had like amazing videos edited by people and we had amazing pictures that they, they sent and we had amazing reports and the room was always clean and no one was ever late. So <laughs> this is like a dream for the person who is doing a training because uh, these are the problems that always are happening when you have like 25 people for seven days. Yeah. Another another tool we actually implementing while we're doing uh, human rights education training courses, it's called inclusive breakfast. So uh, basically the action, it's kind of simulation game. So I will say simulation game. Uh, when people need to come on a breakfast, let's say in a restaurant, and we together with all uh, team of the project or of activity, we uh, dress as uh, authorities as uh, border control guards, as well um, uh, some diplomats, and we do not people let in because they before before uh, night they receive cards with different numbers A, B, C, and D, and we segregate group uh, based on their number with to absolutely randomly, and they not cannot get let's say some stuff from the uh, from the breakfast, and that actually makes people really annoying because you cannot get coffee. Uh, and say, come on. Uh, and this is also the simulation game turn out in absolutely different feelings because it's not that you pretend feel excluded or you pretend to feel discriminated, but you actually are for uh, this half an hour. You cannot. You can, but you know, you're not. And people get really uh, sometimes angry, but in a positive way, of course, you need to reflect on it. But this made them feel. And later, when we gather in a circle and we talk about the experience they had from this breakfast, uh, people are going really emotional and also telling us stories from their life. Or, and, and there is a lot of materials to actually work on it when it's coming to human rights education. So this kind of simulation, uh, when it's involved a small aspect of reality, work really good. Uh, so the question from Claudia. Uh... When you did the inclusive breakfast game, you told them in advance it was a game simulation. No, they didn't know. So what we did in the evening, we give them cards and they say A, B, C, D. And we give them super randomly. And A is like super high class and they are served by uh, waiters. B is like normal people, they get regular breakfast. C people, they uh, sit on like 20 people on the table for like seven people. They're super crowded and they don't get some kind of food. And these, they are not even, they, and also for the people with C card, they have to fill in the visa application form in Albanian language. And for the people with the D card, and most of the people don't know Albanian, and for the people with D card, we do not let them in. 
and they have to fill the application form, but uh, usually Marco is doing, he's tossing the coin. So the coin decides if they come in or not. And we had a lot of people getting, uh, yeah, as Marco said, angry. And I was bribed several times or people were trying to bribe me, giving me like five or 20 euros to get to breakfast. It was really fun. And uh, it was really like, we showed this to show how people are might be treated uh, because of their nationality, ethnicity or uh, race or religion. So, and usually this is a very strong and interesting experience. This is very strong and interesting game. But we need to go forward. And again, we can uh, we can actually share the information how to make this uh, br breakfast. If you want, you can contact us, or we can stay a little bit later, and we will tell how it works. Uh, another type of activity we have it's uh, quite old. It's called LARP, Live Action Role Playing Games. Uh, you can actually also Google it. A lot of materials in Wikipedia, a lot of web pages about it. It's a simulation game, but in real life, in real time. Uh, usually, people quite often use it and uh, on some uh, historical reconstructions of some events, but also can be used in educational uh, purposes. When, for example, together with our participants, they designed uh, an uh, um, election campaign. We can actually uh, show you um, this sample. It's we made it in Ceuta in Spain, uh, and uh, they print this. Um, they develop a um, poster uh, like newspaper, and we actually. But what was the game about, Marco? Tell what was the game about. Uh, the game was about uh, elections and two different uh, perspectives of uh, the same issue. So community need to actually debate and later vote, and it was really fantastic because the what the main. Uh, powerful point of simulation game is that people have possibility for one hour, two hours, doesn't matter how long you design it, do not be themselves. So I'm not Marco anymore. I'm someone and I try to feel and pre play. And actually people are really good on playing what we also learn, uh, really good on lying. Uh, be someone and also make a decision, try at least from perspective of someone. It, and this is actually also built a different narrative in uh, all action. And of course, after you do reflection, you talk about people, what they learn, why they did these steps, and also this, we fight stereotypes, for justice, and et cetera. Yeah, and what is interesting that they even made this newspaper, you can see on the, on the presentation on the left, they prepared like in one night a newspaper with different articles. And uh, when we were in Ceuta, if you know Ceuta is the Spanish city which is uh, in Africa, yeah, it's surrounded by Morocco, so they have a lot of uh, issues connected with migration. And uh, at that point, there, at that time when we were there, there was a demonstration. And if you look at the photo like uh, below, there on the left uh, there is some demonstration it was the photo was made like the, the day before this uh uh yeah the, the day before the actually the event took place so and this was the game developed by our participants after we told them how to do it and our favorite part uh, which me and marco i think we love a lot is uh about escape rooms so the question uh how many of you have ever played at least one escape room? Like, can you put put, put sorry put plus in the uh, chat section if you ever played escape room? Claudia played, right? Susanna, Anna, oh, a lot of people played. Five, fifty. <laughs> yeah, me and Marco, we played like no more, lot, more. Lot, maybe more. Just, just too fun. So I see that uh, we have like five people who stated that they play. And so uh, basically the idea of escape room is it's usually used for entertainment. So the idea is you come to the room and you have to solve puzzles. If you look at the picture that Marco shows on the presentation, uh, this is the escape room made by participants, but usually it looks like this. You come to the room, you have some kind of story. For example, quite often it's a bank robbery or uh, getting out of uh, the jail, or uh, doing some Sherlock Holmes uh, stuff, like uh, doing detective things and finding out about murder. And people have to solve puzzles. And when they solve a puzzle, they get uh, an answer to solve the next one and so on. So those of you who played with us the quest now, this online quest is also quite like, say have similarities to escape room, but escape room is physical. So you come to the room, you play, sometimes you break things and uh, it's connected with the locks, puzzles, 
and a lot of riddles. Yeah, and riddles. But what is making it educational, and why, uh, why, how we start to use it in education of human rights? That the story which people play, it's not about Little Mermaid, but it's actually uh, can be the real life story of some event of people with different cultural background or. Uh, um, migrants or can be uh, the story about um, domestic violence and while you are playing with a team let's say five four people in one hour in this room and you have also environment and no narratives there no puzzles you learn about the topic and you learn the main issues on this topic and you get aware about it you start to know okay I didn't think that this actually might happen or this might be so difficult or such a uh, scary to be just because you look differently in this metro station because you never think about it yeah so uh and also what is important about uh, escape rooms as you have seen in the quest they uh, yeah these are the play like how we actually do training courses on how to and we educate youth workers how to make escape rooms so how it usually works it's a seven days or eight days training course and uh youth workers like they come they create they learn how to make escape rooms and they create escape rooms like in two days, which is like super short time to create an escape room. If you ask a professional how long it takes to create an escape room, they would say from three to six months. <laughs> we do it from one and a half to two days. And uh, then we invite local people to play. So on this picture, you can see this was a project that we made in Spain, in uh, Villa Garcia city in the uh, Galicia region. So uh, we created three rooms and we invited local people to play. And what happened, they came and they learned about some human rights uh, things and some human rights uh, issues. And not only human rights. So for example, on these pictures, you can see the uh, signs for like deaf people signs, you know, that when they show something. And on the right picture, you can see that there was a task to read something, but it was printed in very small letters. And in order to read, you have to have this magnifying lens. And uh, this was a good uh, puzzle because it showed how people, and this was a room actually about uh, physical disabilities. Yeah. So this was the way to show how people with uh, bad eyesight see the reality. So they can see something written, but they cannot actually read it. And if you come and you play this room and uh, you come to this task, you understand that, wow, this is how other people feel. And this is a huge problem. And I understand, and maybe I can somehow support or get involved with them. And uh, maybe we can, yeah, these are examples of the rooms that we built. Maybe we can show, yeah. Should we stop on this one just to give an example, Marco, shortly? Yeah. 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 And so this was a room about the uh, mental uh, health uh, issue. So, and the story was that th there was some one or a couple of cases when uh, people with mental health problems were uh, had their organs taken out without their permission because they cannot control themselves. Uh, uh, people who are not really like nice people, they took their organs away. And there was this story and uh, the people who designed these rooms, their participants of the training course decided to use this idea. So they started with uh, the people you see, like six people in the front. These are actually the gamers, the, the people who come to play players and they are from outside. So they begin their game being chained and uh, blindfolded. And this is actually what happens with the people with mental health issues. They quite often do not understand what is happening around them and they feel like blindfolded and chained. And the first task was for them to unchain them. And then when they play this room, they uh they see they do a lot of tasks and at some point for example if you see there is a white chair in the corner so there is actually a guy sitting there in the wheelchair and at some point they find him and he also gives them a hint and yeah so it, this was like uh, when players played this room and when they came out and we started asking them so what do you think of the how do people with mental health issues feel and they said like wow this was scary and we really need to help these people. We really need to pay attention to these people. And this, the, the game takes place like in one hour. And in one hour, they felt and understood much more than maybe we could tell them in like one year. Because when you feel it, when you play, because and the, because the game is so immersive and so involving, they can, uh, they can feel it. And when they go out, they will never 
treat the people with mental health issues like badly because they know how it feels. Okay, uh, we are not going to stop more in escape room uh, examples because we actually don't have much time. Uh, yeah. But uh, what we can uh, say is that you can do it in really small room without any actually do a lot of changes. So it's just an office and it's stay office, but still it's puzzle there. Uh, and what we learned, I guess, is the most important. Uh, what we need to talk today about it's <laughs> what we learned while uh, we making designing and uh, games for education. So uh, the first point, it's when you set the rules, uh, you need to follow them, be objective and fair. Why? Because um, I had a couple of examples. I was leading a summer camp with the kids, and the kids are playing some games and quests, and they have competition. And then uh, you change rules, or you don't count some of their achievements, and they're getting really pissed off. They're getting frustrated, they're getting annoying, and they find it not fair. And this feeling of being cheated, it's really bad for educational purposes. So uh, even though, so you need to you need to keep uh, your promises and do uh, what is which rules you, you uh, announced to keep a fair uh, competition. Yeah. Another, well, should I say about our example? Yeah, you should always taste test games before you try them on uh, in like in real life and you should also calibrate them to try different difficulties so the people who played the game today the quest they said that it was difficult but actually when me and marco we created this game uh we thought that it's quite easy but we invited our friends to test it so our friends played played it for one hour and they really couldn't solve it and there was one more task and it was like super difficult task and we actually lowered the difficulty of every task that you saw. So uh, starting from the task with the finding out the email and the task with the football team and the task with the uh, PlayStation and the task with the dices. With the dices, it was like this. We just sent a picture of, of six dices and the sentence and no one could ever guess it. For me and Marco, it looked like super easy puzzle because we did like hundreds of those but for people it turned out that it's difficult so what we had to do we actually uh lowered the difficulty and this is what we saw like many 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 times it when you make a game especially when if you lose if you use puzzles or if you use riddles or if you have some kind of complications always try it out and always think about the loopholes or like black holes like uh no black, black doors <laughs> So uh, think about the moments where players can cheat the game. Think about the moments when players can break the game because it can happen quite often. So for example, you make a game about the cleaning and uh, you make a game about reports, but then people manage like to, to not clean because it gives less points and so on. Uh, Francesca, do we have like five more minutes to finish the main point, please? Please let us... I think the the limit is given by the the resistance of the of the people. So you can go on. Just we have uh, a one hour break, and then we will have one uh, in, at three. We will have a couple of uh, we have a session other sessions. before lunch. It's amazing. Oh. Okay, we we have uh, we need five minutes to finish the main points. So don't be afraid to borrow or to steal. Uh, what we want to say here is that all games, all puzzles, all ideas, it's free to use. So if you see a nice puzzle, nice idea in the escape room, feel free to take it and adopt it. Because um, this, this is how we all learn and how the information is going around. Uh, second, uh, whatever you do in any game, try to make some wow, magic, nice points. Like, I mean, I cannot say it was nice today. I was it was nice. nice. It was nice. Come on. But it's still, you know, it still give you some, like, relax moment and also like okay you know like it's a bit changed so whatever you do some small uh, marco, marco speaks about his uh, costume uh, of the evil god and uh, the painting on his face this is this is the kind of the nice stuff we speak about yeah try to and make it if, look nice yeah if you do some cards or boards try to make them that they look aesthetically nice that it's, 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 it's you don't have you you touch it and you have a good feelings about it so this is also what we advise people to do uh emir yeah be flexible about mechanics and approaches what do we mean by that sometimes when you run a game for example we have this team building game called dachniki yeah people really loved your evil god actually uh, image marco wow uh, 
So uh, when we make this team building game, uh, quite often it turns out, especially if it involves discussion and uh, having several people, like having like 20 people involved in one game, at some point you get uh, leaders who pop up and who start to take control of all the discussion and all of the activities which are happening in the room. And sometimes you need other people to come out. And what we do at this point, we don't break the rules because we have this uh, point about setting the rules and following them. But we offer different mechanics. For example, if this game has a time limit, we say, OK, guys, uh, you are almost out of time. But we can give you seven minutes more to finish the game, to solve the task. But uh, if you want to do this, we will take one person, uh, the one that we want to, the one that we choose, out of your team and this person will not play anymore and if they agree we usually we can pick those like the leaders out of the team and then we give the opportunity for other people to rise and to speak up and this is important because sometimes this really helps uh, for the team to learn and see other people this helps people to come together and see that okay these guys they're cool they're leaders and so on but we have other people as well yeah so another point it's a listen to the feedback. So uh, what does it mean uh, to have a perfect game, which is work perfect, you need to play it like 100 times. Uh, when we start, an escape, let's say we play uh, an escape room, uh, the real, in reality, it will be amazing logic and, and cool after playing at least 10 games, when you adopt and change everything what wasn't worked perfectly. So every time you design something new, try it in different uh, targets, and every time you have a feedback, try to adjust it and make it better. And in the end, you have a masterpiece. Then you have yeah. a game which is easy to run, for sure will work, and it's become your, your tool to educate people. So and what is important, that when people give you feedback, you will always feel like, come on, my game is not that bad. It's not that difficult. It's not that stupid in the end, you know, I made it. But be ready that it can be that. I mean, me and Marco, we, we've been doing this for years, but still uh, we make same mistakes because it's impossible not to make these mistakes. And uh, it's absolutely OK to be wrong, but it's it's cool to actually fix the game and make it uh, work. Yeah. Stay low budget. So escape rooms, which we are building uh, like to play, let's say, five times in a room. As far you have a room, room any classroom or hotel room, if you, you have possibility, it costs 20 euro. So because the rest of the stuff is done with the stickers, marker, tape, and paper, and only maybe you need to do some decoration, maybe to buy some uh, uh, teas, which is cost like two euro, etc. So it works. Everything is possible. Yeah. So uh, we we know also in NGO sphere it's not easy to have to have a funding. That's why uh, you, it's actually also possible. And also when you do outdoor activities, it's actually for free and way more cheaper than to do indoor. So uh, also a good uh, good uh, point. Yeah. So uh, Marco, let's get yeah. Let's keep this one because we don't have time. How to, to make an educational game? Last point. So first of all, you need to uh, recognize and know what you want people in the end of your game to learn and to say. So this, this, is, this really is actually important. the most important part of our uh, workshop, of our session. <laughs> you have to have learning goal in uh, the games. If you want to make an educational game, you have to have learning goal because you can create super amazing, super fun game. But if it doesn't have a learning goal in the end, it doesn't work. So. What can be examples of learning goals, Marco? Yeah, the learning goal can be uh, you want people to learn about communication. Then you design a way, uh, the game in this way that people are learning about communication or they talk about it. And it's, it can be about everything, but uh, you can use different levels. For example, if you play um, a game about communication, the game can be that you need to bring oranges from one place to another place. Without, which just doesn't have any any lo uh, connection to communication. But you need to say that people need to be, uh, they cannot uh, come closer or they need to be divided between them like with some distance and then they need to communicate. So, and then you reflect on it. Or, so every game have a different, uh, on different levels you can do it. If it's board game about, uh, I don't know, um, radicalization, 
Let's say, yeah, Emir, you can ex give this example. Yeah. So we were discussing this example. So if you, if you're creating a board game about radicalization, uh, for example, you don't make pieces just pieces. You give pieces roles. So one can be a migrant, other can be uh, some of white uh, supremacist. Yeah, uh, the other one can be social worker. The other one can be police. If you make the field. You know where you move the uh, po the the po like the figures. Then you can make the field not to be just a field with numbers. It can be a city with the areas where you can come if you are white, or you cannot come if you are of different religion. If you are Muslim, and um, if you have if you throw the dice, maybe the dice doesn't need just to show the numbers. It can show you the the amount of time that you have to spend to get from home to work. And because, like, because you are, for example, immigrant, you have to go through uh, through some uh, suburbs and not go through the center or the vice versa. So, if you think it's actually quite easy to put some educational points in the game, uh, but it takes some uh, efforts, and you need to think it through. And when you think it through, in the end, you can have amazing, amazing, amazing game with just little effort. And um, and actually, if you if you take any kind of games that even you play, you can change. I am sure that you can change Monopoly to be an educational game about uh, I don't know finance, culture. Practices, culture. Yeah, it, it's, it is about finance uh, originally, yeah. but you can make it about any, you can change it to anything else. And uh, what is the most important thing, or maybe the the second most important after a learning goal is debriefing. So the briefing is what happens after you finish the game. And we had a short debriefing here and with uh, Claudia, Laura, uh, Yulia, and Ekaterina, I think. And uh, at the debriefing, you ask people, how did the game went? How did the game go? So what they learned, what was interesting for them? And if you have an educational game with some important topics, like for example, you have an educational game with a topic about domestic violence. And we had several of those created by the participants at our training courses. Uh, what you do in the end, you discuss. So why do you think domestic violence is important? What was the story that you just played and why uh, it ended up this way or that way? What was scary for you? What was interesting for you? What did you learn of it? And what will be, how will you behave after you finish this game? How will you behave in your real life? What do you think is important? And to what you will pay attention. So these are the questions, they are open questions that you ask in the end to people and you should always plan some time for debriefing. So if your game, if you have like one day for a game or like say, let's say three hours for the game, plan one or at least half an hour for debriefing. Let people speak about it. And if in the end, after you play the game, you have no, nothing to discuss at the debriefing, then there is a problem with your game. Then you have to change it. Then you have to change the idea. So um, uh, we always, uh, and, and we later can give you the questions for the debriefing. They're quite uh, standard. Uh, what, Marco, what do you love? Uh, flexibility. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can change the game. And yes, uh, this is, I think, the most important part that we uh, wanted to speak about. Uh, we can also speak about narrative levels, but. Uh, Maybe we can do it later. Just to finish, uh, we spoke about escape rooms and we spoke about uh, LARP games. And uh, when we had these training courses, we uh, we photographed and we wrote down everything that we created. So we have like a collection of around uh, 18 escape rooms which have been documented and which any of you can go and take the information. You, there are some pictures, there is text description, there are some videos in some of them. And you can actually build these escape rooms on this on the topics such as um, domestic violence, children rights, women rights, uh, gender equality, migrants, mental health, uh, disabilities, and so on. We will give. Uh, yeah, Marco, can you paste the link? Thank you. Uh, but I think the link will be. Wow, Susanna, you know our site really well. Uh, so yeah, and you can go there. It's absolutely free to use and. If you want to use it, but you do not understand, you can approach me and Marco, or you can write to our email, which we'll show now. And same, we have a couple of toolboxes for LARP games, which you can also use. And um, this was the main thing that we wanted to speak about. And 
because now it's time for the people who need to go for the lunch to go for the lunch. If there are some of you who want to still to have some question to us or who want to have a little discussion, you can stay and you can uh, join actually this video and audio. Yes, Marco? Yeah. yeah. And we can have some little discussion about games and you can ask us questions. But Claudia killer is game. joining. Yes, so I will. I, uh, Marco, can you shortly say the killer game and then we will listen to Claudia's question? Yeah. So the killer game, it's super basic uh, and it's have different variety how we do. But the last one we played here in Poznan in August with a group of 30 people, it was fantastic. So what you do, uh, you have a list of all people's name. Uh, so you have it, you cut them in small pieces. The next one you prepared, you look around where you're working. We have hotel, restaurant and working room and we wrote a places, let's say stairs, Elevator, bathroom. kitchen, bathroom, not really bathroom uh, because it's uh, too much. So some basic places. And another piece of paper, we wrote a tools. Let's say scissors, smartphone, uh, power. earphones, power bank, pen, whatever. And then you randomly distribute for people three papers, place, tool, and a victim, a person. And what you need to do during the five days of training course, you go around and you try to pass to Emir on the stairs with the, my smartphone because it's a tool. And if Emir take it, it means he is dead. So what I do, I collecting all his pieces and I have a new victim. If Emir already was succeed with a lot of victims, I have all anyway someone alive and I go around. And in the end of the game, you actually have either one winner who killed most of the people or a couple of really good professionals, like, or you, if you get yourself, for sure you are safe. So no going, no one going to actually uh, damage you. What does it make? It's make fun. People start to laugh about it. People start to have a lot of jokes about it. People are getting really integrated. They also build a small untrust. Uh, it's it's fantastic game. And it's you made yourself. But, not uh, it's not only about untrust, but also people tend to stay uh, in couples or uh, three people or four people. So they don't stay alone. That is yeah, one yeah. of the most important parts of the game. <laughs> so there is also another version which way more simple when you actually just give people um, a name and uh, they go and try to uh, get this victim. But the, the main rules then that they, they need to be alone. They cannot be in a group. You cannot do it when it's another people see. And then they try it when they go for a coffee break, they go together. You say, hey, Claudia, let's go together for coffee break because I'm afraid that Emir will go with me. And so uh, this is the point. Yeah. Oh, so secret. Claudia, your question. Yeah. Yes, first, thank you, because I'm in love with this session and with the website and all the materials you have. Now I'm in love with the NGO and we will definitely use all these materials. And my question was related because you said about domestic violence. And actually, the other last weekend we had a training about domestic violence and my colleague and I were discussing how to include uh, non-formal education activities like games. And we were discussing like, how to do this with such a harsh topic, such as domestic violence, not to trigger any trauma, not to deal, like not to um, take a serious topic as a funny thing. And I wanted to know if you have experience on doing this and how you approach this topic. Mm -hmm. I, I can comment on it. So uh, first of all, we indicate, uh, not all people know that the some actions have happened, but it's actually domestic violence. Because domestic violence, it's a topic which have different levels also. For example, it can be domestic violence, not physical, but psychical. And also can be manipulation based on uh, financial depending of female, of male, and also in, in a lot of different senses. And then it's also violence. So what we do, when we do an escape room on this topic, People are going inside, they solve a the puzzle, and then they understand that they actually the violence was happening in this particular topic, that it was manipulated based on financial pressure. First of all, people need to be aware about that it's is it's it violence because a lot of times people not even can recognize and say that it's domestic violence. The victims think that it's normal. Second, also neighbors know. All relatives mostly know, best friends know about the accident, but they never show up. 
the Nova coming out. So what we do, we actually in this story we provide in in stories. It can be stories. What will happen if you will not show up? If you will not tell? And also uh, how to where to go? You know, if you find out how to work with it, how to suggest a victim or uh, how to report it in this way that it will be recorded and actions will be taken. So this what we do. Uh, how to make it in a not harmful way? Uh, no, no. I guess uh, it will be difficult to work with the victims. So I will suggest to work only with the stories. Uh, and uh, also, uh, yeah, the stories can be can be okay, not so harmful. It can be video, it can be materials, it can be photographs, it can be game, uh, it can be just talks, it can be simulation, and then right. then the environment is enough. Yeah, so in one of the games, uh, escape room games on the domestic violence, what our participants did, that they created the story about a woman who is suffering from domestic violence, but she will not divorce because she still uh, holds up to her marriage. And she holds on to, I'm sorry. So she still, and why? When the players play, they find such words as family, love, relations, um, happiness. And all of these words, they're broken. So when they find, they solve the puzzle, they actually put the pieces together, but they are broken pieces. And when the, and actually in that room, there was a person inside the room who was not playing, but who was uh, showing the victim. And she didn't speak. She didn't do anything through one hour of the game. She was just sitting on the bed. And in the end, when the players finish the game, she stands up and she tells her story, like, why, what happened here? And she tells that, so I do not want to break my marriage because I still love my husband and I remember of the good memories and we have two children and I'm afraid and no one will help. And this like last three minutes of her speech combined with the way that she was sitting silent before for one hour makes like such a strong effect that now like three years later after I played this game, I still feel uh, the shivers on my skin because it's it was such a strong message and there was no need to show anything like uh, violent, like bad pictures or blood or anything. It was like super clear, super understandable. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, I hope we answered your question. And we have some yes, uh, examples yes. of the domestic violence games in the toolboxes as well. Thank you, guys. I, I leave the floor for someone else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia, for the question. Yeah, and uh, I think that we had one more question. We will answer it, and then maybe we can finish. Susanna asked about the less violating variation, no killing narrative. Of course, you can make it. You can call it anyway. You can call it friendship game. It's going to be also. Uh, yeah, we also played it one like let's say in Corona time. It's not the best way, but when you need to hug a person or you need to yeah. kiss on a check. Uh, okay. and yeah. can you can be also friend not game and you don't kill a person, but you make friends with him in this way. And you may when you make a friend, he becomes your only friend and then you only you can make friends. So it's it's easy. Yeah, it's, this is what we uh, what we meant when we said about being flexible. Okay, yeah, so, not, because not all games you can play with the uh, miners.